Welcome once again to 20 Minute Topic. I'm Marcus Stead and I'm joined as ever by veteran campaigner and blogger Greg Lance Watkins. This week we're going to do the first part of a two-part podcast on the subject of personal responsibility. Greg, the cost of the welfare state uh, for this financial year we're in now, 2019-20, is estimated to be £222 billion. It was around 4% of national income in 1948-49, and nowadays it's nearly 13%. And when the welfare state was created, it was a safety net. But is it now the case that for a lot of people it's regarded as a lifestyle choice? I think for far too many people it's regarded as a lifestyle choice. Uh, When you think that we had no pensions, we had until 1908, We had no health service until 1947-48 and people saved, put their pennies by to pay for emergencies. Mm. Um, There was no unemployment benefit except there was uh, the the penny a week um, policy collector who came around um, to the door and collected um, literally a few pennies off of people for some of the basic needs. But people were expected to look after themselves. Yes, and and we we look at the history of this. Now, traditionally, even going back to my grandparents' generation, the general norm, although it was never a perfect world, and I'm the first to acknowledge this, was that you got married, you had your children inside of marriage, the man went out to work to provide for the family, the woman brought up the child, and very often the, the family either had a garden or an allotment on which you would grow your fruit and veg and when the welfare state came into being it was regarded by and large as a safety net if the man of the house had an industrial accident the the welfare state would ensure that you still put food on the table and the children don't go without um but nowadays it, it and it's been something that's crept up as generations have gone on people having children outside of marriage with people with whom they are not committed And what's happening, is it not, is that the state is taking on more and more responsibility for finance that was once something that was inside the family. Not only was it inside the family, it was also to some extent within inside society Mm. Um, because villages, towns used to help people out. Um, The local landowner had a a fundamental respect for his workers, just as his workers had a fundamental respect for their landowner. Mm. And it was, if you go back to those days, it was a hard life, but there was far more uh, work around Mm. to fit every member of society. Mm. Um, I remember um, tales in uh, my father's village when where he lived after they left the valleys in Wales. Um, They went to Yate, um, which is now just a suburb of Bristol, but was a long way out of Bristol in those days. Mm. And around Yate and Chipping Sodbury, there was a chap known as Alec the Whip. Mm. And he always carried a whip, and he was always walking everywhere. And he he wasn't homeless, but he didn't have a home of his own. Um, he was put out, I think, in an outbuilding of somebody else's home. Mm. And if you saw Alec, you could say, um, give him a couple of pennies, which, of course, was um, not like giving somebody a couple of pennies nowadays. Yeah. Um, in the, A penny could actually buy something. Mm. Um, and he would run errands for you. He would um, carry shopping for you. Um, he would uh, even go and meet your children from school if need be. Mm. Um, and although he was as batty as a box of frogs, mm. he had a paid role in the society mm. that people had created for him, mm. which meant he had self-respect, everyone knew who he was, um, and anybody with um, any kind of transport, um, even if it was a horse and cart, um, would give him a lift um, because 
He was a member of the society. What sort of work did he do then? None. He, the, the sort I've just said. Um, he might get uh, a few hours of cleaning out a ditch or hmm. um, trimming a hedge or um, tidying up a verge. So an, an odd job man, but somebody who also would pick up your children from school or help out with things that needed doing in the community, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We have seen recently, haven't we, um, the cancellation of the Jeremy Kyle show on ITV, which had been running for, what, 14, 15 years, I think. And we saw on there every single morning examples of people, I think, who had become welfare dependent through lifestyle choices they had made. It's like you expressed in last week's podcast, you disliked the phrase falling pregnant. Well, no, pregnancy is a consequence of an action and you know what that action is and you know where it may well lead. And is it not the case that whereas welfare was once something you could fall back on in exceptional circumstances, the death of your husband or your husband being laid off work or having an industrial accident, we saw on Jeremy Kyle there are a significant minority of people who now, in this country, who now think welfare is an acceptable lifestyle choice. I look around sometimes and wonder if it's a significant minority. Mm. Um, There seem to be an awful lot of people who seem to lead a really quite pleasant life without doing any work. Um, They're either um, got themselves cushy numbers as counsellors or... um, jobs um working supposedly working for the state Mm. um frequently wildly overpaid Mm. um for the work they're doing and not cost effective Mm. um dependent on minimum wages Mm. and we find ourselves in the ridiculous position that because our own indigenous population have become so um feather bedded many of them have no intention of doing any work for their money mm. um and there are many jobs in the society that um they feel um they're above doing mm. um whether that's um picking vegetables or rubbish collection or the demeaned jobs in society and we siphon in people from other countries to do them. Well, yes, because we have examples. Um, I, I saw a feature on the RT channel, uh, formerly called Russia Today, um, the RT News Channel, and they did a feature from um, Lincolnshire, I think it was, um, the the country south outside Boston in Lincolnshire. And they, they looked at the fruit farms, and it was seasonal labour, mainly from Poland, but also from other country, doing jobs that British young people in particular think they are above doing. But what this work was, well, point one, the workers there said, yes, we do have to work hard. It's actually not that badly paid. It's also quite good fun because you make friends and you're out in the field all day. And it's also character building. But it goes beyond fruit picking. It's finding people to wait tables in restaurants or wipe down tables or clean the toilets in restaurants. A lot of people in this country think they're above that sort of thing, it seems to me. When you go back to, um, I'm in my 70s, when you go back to my childhood, mm. I can remember people then who whose annual holiday was hop picking in Kent mm. or um, carrot lifting in um, wherever they grow carrots. Mm. Um, but they worked on the land for two weeks and the the whole family would go mm. and they'd live in glorified sheds as a family and they'd all help out on pay their way doing this mm. and make a little bit of extra money. Yeah, and that was the holiday in those days for to do that. And it was the only holiday that most families would have. Yes, and and I'm going to move this conversation on now to the subject of food banks. Now, I am of the view that while there may be exceptions along the way, a lot of people who use food banks are essentially bad at budgeting, I think. Now, for example, if you are relying on welfare to support yourself and your children, the first thing I would do is I would make sure I was doing the obvious things, like doing my my shopping at a budget supermarket like Aldi or Lidl, If I was working during the day, I would take a thermos 
flask to work and a packet of sandwiches rather than going to the local chain coffee shop where it's what four or five quid for a coffee plus a cake as well well that's a significant chunk out your day's wages straight away um do you agree with me that a lot of people who use food banks are essentially very bad at budgeting um well they have to budget in such essentials as lottery tickets Mm. cigarettes beer Mm. um but that doesn't leave them much for non-essentials like feeding their children yep yep and it does seem to me in a, in so-called deprived areas there do seem to be rather a lot of pubs amusement arcades and betting shops now i've got nothing against those things existing in society but they do seem prevalent in areas where apparently there's a lot of deprivation uh, they're also the cause of a lot of deprivation hmm. In their own right. Yes. Um, any idiot who goes into get, um, betting shops and puts money on things must reasonably expect to lose. I actually bought a betting shop mm. when a well-known chain moved out into more deluxe premises, mm. having uh, made money out of um, their customers. And chatting to their finance director, who was responsible for the sale of this property, he said, uh, we don't need any of the fixtures and fittings in there. You can have them if you want them, dump them if you want them. Um, And that went for quite a lot of other things in there, um, including the safe systems and the CCTV, because they were just totally modifying. I said, surely that can't be cost effective for you. He said, nah, it doesn't matter, we're moving to better premises. He said, we're, we're bound to make better profits. Hmm. And I said, but you've only got a pool of people because it's the same area. He said, no, but um, it'll be bigger square footage so more people can come in. Uh, we'll have extra tellers. And he said, um, we make a living out of basically selling uh, five pound notes for three pound fifty. Well, yes, but the the economy of scale is changing at the moment because uh, well, William Hill announced just last week that they're closing down several thousand shops because the uh, the rules on f- fixed odds betting terminals are changing. Now, the one thing I won't go near if I'm in a betting shop is a fixed odds betting terminal because you're playing games on there like roulette, except it's not really roulette that you're playing at all. It is um, it's a machine designed to make money where you're looking into a screen that's, that's designed to make money and it's not a fair game of roulette. But what's happening now is the maximum stake is being cut from £100. I think it used to be £100, but it's being cut to just £2. And what William Hill have concluded, and the others are likely to follow, is that they're not really making their money from horse racing or greyhound racing or people putting a few quid here and there. They're making money from people who are severely addicted to FOBTs, fixed odds betting terminals. So there's going to be a cultural change in betting shops in a not too distant future. There will be fewer of them. But of course, that moves the problem just online, doesn't it? That's how it seems to me. Well, nowadays we're talking of this competition for uh, that is closing down people like William Hill and so on mm. isn't, in fact, the fixed odd betting che- law changes. It's the internet. I can go on the internet as soon as we finish this conversation and I can um, bet on three channels at once. Mm. Um, and even if you're doing it in small amounts, Mm. Uh, that will be a small amount lost. Uh, well, they'll make sure you win a few times to sucker punch you into going on. Mm. Um, and then uh, you'll go on, you can lose, even if it's only a £2 stake, mm. uh, you can lose that what, every 30 seconds um, mm. on three different channels at once. Um so you're looking at losing over a ten or a minute. So it's clear then that there's, well, I've thought this for some time, there's an, a hidden epidemic of people who are addicted or are misusing online gambling and that's affecting their ability to provide for their families. That much is clear to me. Um, well, why not just bang your head on the wall? You know, if you want to be addicted to something, at least that'll leave you some change at the end of the day. And it's equally as stupid as 
um, selling um, your money for less money to a betting chain. Um, I actually had a shop at, for a short while um, with six, call it fruit machines, if you like, one-armed bandits. Mm. And we used to go in, and if it was a busy day, um, we'd tune it to make their ability to buy money more expensive. Mm. Mm. Um, it was quite ludicrous. The thing to remember, I think, and I, I can't emphasise this point strongly enough, that those fixed odd betting terminals, the modern day ones, where you can play roulette and various other games, always remember, if you're in a betting shop, that game you are playing is not roulette. It is a machine designed to make money. And that's something people need to be aware of. I also think there's a very big difference between gambling in a betting shop and gambling at home. Because if you are in a betting shop, at the very least, you are handing cash across a counter. You are in a controlled environment, so you've got that element of shame if it's getting out of control. And they have the power to bar you. Whereas if you are at home, in the privacy of your bedroom or your living room, quite possibly under the influence of alcohol, and you don't have that physical element of handing money over, it can be a far more dangerous thing, I believe. Oh, I think it's a bit like opening a bottle at home. Mm. Um, you drink it until it's empty mm. um, because no one's watching. Mm. Um, out, you've got to keep on paying for each drink. Mm. Uh, so even you are aware that you can barely stagger to the bar anymore. Mm. Mm. Um, the ability to gamble online is absolutely pernicious and the people start out... Um, I don't know of anybody who has consistently won decent amounts of money betting online. Well, it's no. almost as half-baked mm. as sitting there for endless hours playing electronic games mm. that were designed by some little Japanese chap rigging a, a chip to be outwitted at a certain skill level. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what is the point? The only people who are making money through online gambling are people who are using the betting exchanges of Betfair and BetDAC and, and sites like that, where you can effectively become the bookmaker by both um, betting on and laying against sporting events. On the subject of online games like roulette and various blackjack card games and so forth, I don't think I know anyone who's beaten the system on that. Um, the, the, the only way there are a small number of professional gamblers on sport who by backing and laying sporting events on the exchange sites are making money but by and large they are not um, so I, I would advise people if you are going to gamble at all gamble in a controlled environment in a betting shop and do it with money you are prepared to lose and if you Marcus, win it's a bonus Marcus I live in a betting town mm. uh, we have a race course Yes. And you watch, you watch the um, owners, trainers uh, and the like turn up the day before races, stay in the best hotels, um, park their rollers and their Bentleys and their Ferraris um, conveniently, um, eat well, uh, go to the races, stay the night usually amongst their chums afterwards, um, enjoying life and you watch the punters turning up in, in coach loads mm. um, or on the train and walking from the railway station to the race course which is roughly a mile mile and a half mm. um, and going back and those who've made a bit of money on the day um, being an absolute pain in the butt in the town because they're all wandering around drunk out of their minds and behaving like complete idiots mm. um, and you know immediately that it's the bookies the owners the trainers and the jockeys who are making the money mm. and the rest have come to lose their money somebody's got to pay for the owners the jockeys the trainers and the horses yep yep and there's an old saying that las vegas is built on the money of losers yeah, um, and uh, Las Vegas, having been there, having stayed in Las Vegas, not as a gambler, 
not even interested in the clubs, but purely out of curiosity. What a seedy dump it is, the second you're off of the strip. Mm. And it looks very glorious as long as you take photographs of the big hotels mm. or obliquely having a sequence of them. Mm. It's the gaps in between and the glorified shacks that half the people who work in the hotels live in. Thank you, Greg. And there'll be a second podcast in a few weeks' time on the subject of personal responsibility and the welfare state. But join us again next week when we'll be looking at the challenges facing Boris Johnson as he becomes Britain's new Prime Minister. Thank you for listening. See you next week. Mm -hmm.